Praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him and we ask Him for guidance and forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead Him astray, and whom He makes astray, no one can lead him back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah by himself, no associate to him, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and messenger. O oh, you who believed, be conscious of Allah with all the consciousness that is due to him, and do not let death overtake you until you have surrendered to him. O oh, you who believed, be conscious of Allah and always say a word directed to the truth that he may make your conduct whole and sound and forgive you your sins. He that obeys Allah and his messenger has then attained the highest achievement. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My dear uh, sisters and brothers, Today I'll share some reflections on family, some of the motives and lessons that the Quran offers us about family, as well as the role of families in our relationship with Allah. Families are featured extensively in the Quranic narrative, be it in the story of human origins, stories of our prophets, the description of the end of times or the hereafter, and the many laws that were laid out in the Medinan period of revelation. Most of the time it is the family setting upon which the Quran's narrative and guidance unfolds for us. Family is the microcosm of the bigger community that we are asked to envision and construct. In Islamic terminology, Allah is never referred to as a father or a mother. A kinship metaphor has not been used in the depiction of Allah's intimacy with us. Instead, we are called the children of Adam in the Quran. Quran declares again and again that Allah does not have any mates and no children. But at the same time, the fact that human beings have been created as pairs and have been given the ability to procreate is put forward as a sign of Allah's majesty. God created you from dust, then from a drop, then made you pairs. And no female bears or brings forth, save with his knowledge. The way Allah describes his relationship to human beings is that of an all-knowing creator, the best of providers, a master who at the same time is a caretaker, as the name Rab implies. And it is these attributes of Allah that we see being manifested in the lives of the prophets and their families throughout the Quranic narrative. But Allah is not an actor like all the other actors in these stories. Instead, what we see is that Allah inspires the family members to assume these caretaking roles. It's the family that supports one another in times of need, that offers guidance in challenging situations and extends forgiveness when moral failures happen. I'll share a few examples from our sacred history where this occurs. One of the most poignant moments in the Quran is the time when the mother of Prophet Musa is inspired by Allah to place her newborn son in a chest and to throw him into the river. This was in the face of Pharaoh's order to murder, murder all the male children born to the Israelites. The mother asks her daughter to follow the chest and the young girl obediently and quite bravely follows her mother's command. When she sees the women at the palace take the baby in, she decides on her own to approach them and offers to 
find them in Earthmate. And thus she intuitively finds a way to bring the family together under the difficult new circumstances. And thus she brings comfort to her mother's heart. Allah is with the family inspiring them as they face extreme hardship. And you can feel Allah's protective gaze as the family takes care of each other. Another story of separation and reunion is that of Prophet Yusuf. But interestingly, in this story, the family is itself a source of trial. The conniving older brothers are the reason Prophet Yusuf was separated from his doting parents. Allah supports the parents through the years of extreme grief, giving them hope and patience as Prophet Yusuf goes through further trials, including imprisonment. But when he overcomes these, those difficult years and gains power serving the king, he does not use his power to avenge the crimes against him. He only brings the family together and his kind treatment of the older brothers make them, makes them realize that their mistakes. The parents find comfort in the reuniting and the transformation in the family dynamics. By calling this a beautiful story, Allah is giving the actions of Prophet Yusuf his approval. The story is shown to be a fulfillment of Allah's own plans, the realization of a dream that Yusuf sees as a child. Again, Allah is not an actor like all the other actors, and yet Allah's presence is there throughout. These stories become beautiful examples to inspire us in our own relationships and to help us understand Allah's commandments about our responsibility to our, towards our family. Mutual dependency is an important facet of human existence. We are used to seeing independence and self-reliance glorified, but the reality of our lives is that none of us are really independent. As the Quran reminds us frequently, we began our life as a drop of fluid, and then it is in the mother's womb that each one of us is nurtured and formed. And it is the caregiving of parents or foster parents that helps each one of us survive infancy and childhood. This dependency continues into adulthood and all of us exist in a complex web of interdependence. Allah's mercy and love is the fount from which all creation comes into being. And probably this is why the Arabic word for womb as well as the word for family stem from the same root word as the divine names Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. There is the verse that is repeated at each Juma, which I'm sure you are all familiar with from Surah Al-Nisa. O mankind, be conscious of your sustainer who has created you out of one living entity and out of it created its mate and out of the two spread abroad a multitude of men and women. And remain conscious of God, in whose name you demand rights from one another, and of these ties of kinship. Verily, God is ever watchful over you. In this verse, what is translated as ties of kinship is the word arham, which means wombs. If we think about it, all family relationships are based on a connection to a womb. And the essence of a womb is a nurturing compassion, the source of which is Allah. In the prime of our life, we tend to believe in our independence. But as we approach the threshold of our declining years, we become acutely aware of this web of interdependence. There is a Quranic verse that very accurately describes this coming of age that happens to us. And we have enjoined upon man to his parents good treatment. His mother carried him with hardship and gave birth to him with hardship and his gestation and weaning is 30 months. He grows until when he reaches maturity and reaches the age of 40 years, he says, my Lord, Enable me to be grateful for your favor, which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents, and to work righteousness of which you will approve, and make me righteous for me, my offspring, 
Indeed, I have repented to you, and indeed, I am of those who surrender. There is a profoundly beautiful dua in that verse, one that has assumed a great significance for me lately. Probably because I am of a similar age, I see my parents on the verge of old age, and my children on the cusp of complete adulthood and ready to begin lives on their own. At my age, you begin to see life in a larger frame, a perspective that is more zoomed out. Of all the relationships, it is our duty to our parents that is stressed the most. And we are told in Surah Al-Isra, and your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him, and to parents show good treatment. Whether one or both of them reach old age with you, say not to them as much as of, and do not repel them, but speak to them a noble word. And lower to them the wing of humility out of mercy and say, my Lord, have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. In this, uh, in explaining this verse, Muhammad Asad writes, whereas God is the real ultimate cause of man's coming to life, his parents are its outward immediate cause. This is why the call to worship none but Allah is followed by a reminder about treating parents respectfully. Quran may be the only scripture that describes the birth pangs of a mother. We hear Maryam alayhi salam crying out saying, only if I just died before this. Similarly, there are multiple verses about breastfeeding. The story of baby Musa and his mother makes this natural, beautiful, but also an extremely difficult motherly responsibility, a part of our sacred history. When these verses are recited, these duties of mothers that tend to be taken for granted become part of our religious ritual. We prepare Muslims for the commands concerning these matters. Being a mother is both physically and emotionally draining, no doubt. This is the reason why the Quran explicitly commands husbands to be a support, emotionally as well as financially, to their wives. Unfortunately, the verses in the Quran on marital roles have been read, have been often read from a male perspective, centered on men's rights over women, and not from the respective perspective, not from a perspective of equity, the well-being of the women, the children, and the family as such. It's misleading to think that the Quran's intention is to maintain a hierarchy or strict gender roles. All relationships suffer in such a rigid framework. So a beautiful, righteous marriage is built on respect, love, and compassion for one another, and an equitable sharing of responsibilities. Marriage is vital and has been given great importance in the Islamic tradition. It is marriage that initiates the connections of the womb that give rise to the larger family connections. These extended connections are also important. Keeping ties with relatives is called Silatul Rahim in the Islamic tradition. There are numerous verses in the Quran reminding us about our duty to our extended family, to keep ties with them, to help them in their time of need, to make sure they get what is rightfully theirs from the inheritance, to speak good words to them and to protect the orphans in the family. We know that it's not practical to maintain close connections with relatives many times removed from us, but we have to put the effort towards our closer family, like siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. Regular visits, phone calls, WhatsApp groups are all means that we use today to maintain ties. Good communication skills are essential, and we should not shy away from offering help. If someone asks for help, we have to try our best to help them. Human tendency is to lose connection with the relatives who are financially and socially struggling. And this is where Allah's reminders should really do the work. It is permissible to spend, it is permissible on us to spend a portion of our zakat on family members who are in difficulty 
as long as those members are not people we are legally obligated to provide for like parents spouses and children similarly in the event of a death the estate of the deceased has to be distributed correctly and promptly to avoid dissension allah says in surah al baqara verse 180 that when death seems near people blessed with considerable wealth should make sure to leave bequests for one's parents as well as particularly needy family members in a fair manner it's understood that this is in addition to what is legally their share if keeping ties is considered a good deed breaking ties with one's family is considered a grievous sin and it is referred to as qataul uh, rahim this verse from surah al raad has been has always been interpreted as speaking about this but those who break the covenant of allah after contracting it and sever that which allah has ordered to be joined and spread corruption on earth for them is the curse and they'll have the worst home and verse 22 from surah al nur also wants wealthy people who will not give aid to relatives as well as the needy and the people who migrate for allah's sake there's also a warning for people who won't pardon and overlook and then we are asked if we wouldn't want allah to forgive and pardon us thus making it clear that our duty is to extend the same mercy that allah extends to us the quranic commandments that ask us to remember and do good to our family and relatives is by no means a command for us to become tribal and uninterested in the larger community we begin all de- good deeds from our immediate surroundings and family is a network we are born into and this is why family get connections get so much emphasis but at the same time we are warned about a hollow pride based on our wealth children lineage in the verses where allah reminds us about our parents and kin are also reminders about our neighbors the poor the slaves etc for example this verse from surah al nisa it's 36th verse serve allah and join not any partners with him and do good to parents kinsfolk orphans those in need neighbors who are near neighbors who are strangers the companions by your side the wayfarer and what your right hands possess for allah loves not the arrogant the boastful family is a great support for our intentions of doing good in the world so it's important for the family to support one another in acts of righteousness if there are people taking leadership in the social realm offer them support and strengthen them in every way jealousy gossiping backbiting are all harmful to relationships in general and these apply to the family as well sometimes the tendency is to throw off all our guards when it comes to family it's true that there is ro- room for informality in the family circle but that should not lead us to behave in harsh and unkind ways another thing we have to remember is that the command to keep ties with family is irrespective of their religious beliefs or background we are not being asked to maintain ties only with muslim relatives some relatives may not be receptive to our beliefs but that should not stop us from maintaining ties and in the case of relatives struggling with basic needs our duty is to provide help to meet to to help them meet those needs before we do any moralizing and all of us have difficult relationships and there are times when our own well being is affected by certain relationships these are exceptional circumstances and we have to assess these situations based on the unique factors pertaining to it by no means does allah intend to harm us or burden us greatly I would say that Allah intends to keep our heart in the right place even in such situations. Resentment and bitterness will only harm us more. We should pray that Allah helps us make peace even in such cases and we should refrain from intentionally harming anyone. 
As for the beautiful and valuable relationships that we keep, Allah promises us that family relationships continue in the hereafter, and there is a reuniting that happens there. Gardens of perpetual bliss, they shall enter there, as well as the righteous among their fathers, their spouses, and their offspring. And angels shall enter unto them from every gate. So, alhamdulillah for our families, whatever shape or form they come in. Let's remember here once again that we are not narrowing our worldview to our family. Family is the idea that Islam brings to the larger humanity as well. And we have to think of ourselves as children of Adam which means that there is a larger family that we belong to and that we should show love and concern for. And in matters of justice, we should make sure that, that we stand on the side of justice, not be swayed by familial connections or other interests. As this verse from Quran so clearly states, say, if it be that your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your mates, or your kindred, the wealth that you have gained, the commerce in which you fear a decline, or the dwellings in which you delight are dearer to you than Allah or his messenger, or the striving in his cause, then wait until Allah brings about his decision, and Allah guides not the rebellious. So ultimately, piety is what decides our standing with Allah, not our family heritage. If there's a lineage that we should be concerned with, it is the one that includes us in the spiritual lineage of prophets who manifested Allah's own love and mercy towards all creation. Prophet Muhammad wasallam, is called a mercy for the world. Our goal is to follow in his footsteps. I end with the dua that we are able to fulfill our responsibilities to our parents, to our children, to our family, to the communities we belong to and to create a peaceful, harmonious coexistence with all of Allah's creation. Let's also remember here the people in Pakistan who are dealing with the aftermath of a catastrophic flood. The suffering is there is not getting the attention it should be getting. Glacial melt as well as extreme monsoon rains that scientists think will more, become more and more common in South Asia both due to climate change, are said to have led to this flood. It's a, sad, it's a sad fact that the countries and the poor people in those countries who are bearing the brunt of these disasters are not the ones who are generating the bulk of these greenhouse gases. So people living in developed nations, the global north, who are morally obligated to help the victims, as well as to change their lives their way of life i hope and pray that we are all able to help generously and uh, i hope the country and its people can cope and come back to their feet again rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azab our lord give us good in this world and in the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the fire Rabbana la tuzik kulubana ba'da iz hadaytana wahab lana min ladunka rahma inna kanta al-wahab. Our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate after you have guided us. Grant us your mercy. You are the ever-giving. Amen. Thank you for listening and Jumma Mubarak to all of you.